team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience, as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your favorite CCT personality, JTAC extraordinaire, embracer of the ridiculous face, and like the shortest operator you'll ever meet, Peaches. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ones Ready Podcast. We're happy to have you. Thanks for joining us. Um, you know, you guys have been tuning in every single week and we certainly appreciate that. So thanks to you guys and also thanks to some of our partners that we have. You know, we've we've got Alpha Brew, we've got Eberly Stock, we've got Outer Eggs Pomade, we've got Hoist, uh, even Trench Coffee Companies jumped in there. So if you guys want to enjoy some of their products, you guys can go to their site, uh, their respective sites, and then you can use the promo code ONES READY to get a discount. And uh, even some of those will also donate to charity as well, some of their specific charities. So you're helping out a good cause and you're getting a good deal for good products. So um, something that I'm actually kind of learning myself, you would think that I would know this by now, but I don't. So we decided to bring in a guest Brent Manny to talk about PJs doing space stuff. Everybody knows that the Space Force is now a thing, um, so everybody's excited about it. It's, space Force is so hot right now, I'm not sure if it's as hot as SR, but I mean, you be the judge of that. Brent, you want to take us through at least your background because we try and get a, at least some kind of bona fides or, or credibility just so people know who we're actually talking to. And then we'll start diving into some of the questions because I'm, I've got to tell you, I don't know uh, anything about this low orbit rescues, how any of that's going to work. So I'm interested to hear about it. So you mind telling us a little bit about it? Yeah, man. Uh, so... First of all, I have no credibility, so you can just nip that in the bud right now. I'm just <laughs> well, a guy. You're, in good, you're in good company. <laughs> right on. So, yeah, my name is Brent uh, Manny. I, I was a PJ. Uh, I've got about 26 years of total federal service, but uh, most of that now, the vast majority of that has been as a civil servant. Um, I came, I'm actually from North Florida. I uh, came in the Air Force in 1994. I did the two year pipeline, graduated the schoolhouse in 96. Um, I, I got orders to Patrick initially, which is where I did my pass test because I used to skip school and come down here to surf. And uh, I was really excited about orders to Patrick. And then about a month before graduation, I said, you're going to Moody. And I uh, didn't know where Hooray. the hell that was. Yeah. That's, a ch- that's a change. Hooray. Yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was one of four <laughs> PJs to, to be the first to set foot at Moody Air Force Base. It was awkward. Um, and so I was there from, from about 96 to 99. And in my time there... I was really big into skydiving uh, uh, back when the camera cr- cameras that we flew on our heads were the big giant ones. I was training with Bob Holler to get on the stars team and uh, I, I got in a really bad parachuting accident, broke my spine. Um, just prior to that, I had selected for the two, four when they were doing this whole new concept called green team. And uh, they said, Hey, you can still come to Fort Bragg, but you could go across the street and teach until you can get returned to duty with this pretty nasty back injury. And I'm like, I'll do it. Uh, and that was the end of my operational career and the beginning of my teaching career because uh, I never got back on status. So I did go to Fort Bragg. I was there from 99 to 2002 where I, where I was the PJ instructor at the Joint Special Operations Medical Training Center. Uh, for your listeners that may or may not know, that's where the 18 Deltas, the Ranger Medics the, at the time, the SEAL Medics, uh, the, the SARCs, the Special Amphibious Reconnaissance Corpsmen, all those guys came there to the joint school along with the PJs. Um, and then in 2002, I was tapped on the shoulder and said, hey, the Air Force is wanting to pull out of this school. And it, it, a lot had to do with the paramedic. The Army was getting rid of the paramedic because 9-11, of course, happened. And we required the paramedic. And so I, I moved out to Albuquerque and helped stand up the, at the time, the active duty Air Force paramedic program uh, that we thought was going to be really awesome. And then we learned, wow, there's no people uh, around to teach this stuff because there's a pretty serious war going on. And we contracted that out. Um, and then in 2004, uh, really late 2003, I could not get returned to duty. I ended up switching over to being a regular Air Force med tech because I was right at about that 10-year mark. And I made that decision like, I'm, I'm in it. I might as well stick it out. Um, and then I went to Korea as a regular Air Force med tech. About six months into that, I realized, wow, <laughs> I need to stay <laughs> around my community. I, I, I didn't do well in the regular Air Force. I regret these decisions. <laughs> there, have I, been, there have been mistakes I that I made. Right 
I'll tell you right now, if, if, if ever anything should be on my gravestone, it would be uh, if your only purpose in life is to serve as a warning to others, because I've made every mistake there is to make. Uh, so that's definitely uh, one of the mistakes I made. And it wasn't, I enjoyed my Air Force career there. I just, it wasn't for me. So luckily I was able to get back to Kirtland um, on my last uh, couple of years in, on active duty. And I, I wrote out my last two years as a, as a med tech at the schoolhouse, former PJ teaching medicine. And then in 06, I switched over. I was one of the first civil servant instructors there at Kirtland. And then from 2006 to 2013, I was a GS uh, instructor. At some point, I switched over from teaching medicine because I kind of got burned out on it. I did weapons, tactics. And then some of you guys got to experience the FTX uh, that myself. And I have to give a shout out to Richard Oberstar. Uh, I don't know if he's still even out there, but uh, and then Colon Lopez, CZ, who was my classmate and then came back to be the commandant. And now he's like, you know, king of the world. Uh, him, and I, him and I text every now and then. I, I, I texted him when he made SEAC. I t- sent him a text. I said, you know, when we were cones going through the OLH, did you ever think I'd be in the Space Force and you'd be the SEAC? And we just like laughed. <laughs> well, hey, that, that does bring up a good time. We did a bad disservice to you, Brent. Why don't you throw your disclaimer out there? Just like us, you're speaking for yourself and yourself only. You're not speaking for the Space Force or for... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. good catch. So uh, <laughs> disclaimer, you know, I, I'm speaking purely on uh, my own accord here. Nothing that I say is the uh, opinions of the United States Space Force, the United States Space Command, the DOD, or NASA. So this is just Brent talking with the dudes in the team room. So don't come after me. Well, but yeah, so uh, go ahead. I, I actually want to pause you there, right? Because like, yeah. I, I don't want to overlook the fact that you have, what What did you, is it 15 years of instruction? How, mu- how many years of instruction do you have? Uh, I think it capped out to a little over 14, almost 15 years between active duty and civil service. There was one year that was a gray area because I was in Korea, but I didn't miss a class. I, I left for Korea teaching a paramedic class and then when I came back from Korea, because you guys are there for a whole year, I still interacted with that group of that group of guys. One of the dudes at my going away when I left Kirtland to come here uh, went in and counted all the uh, names and plaques, and and they uh, said that I at the time I left the schoolhouse, I had trained eighty percent of the GA community that was currently serving between guard reserve and active duty. And I was, that's wild. Well, I mean, for this podcast, yeah. you did a hundred percent of it. Cause Brian and I were both on teams oh, yeah. that you were, you were instructors in the year 2008. I know it was your best year at the schoolhouse. Cause Brian and I both graduated. <laughs> that was, those were good times, man. 2000. <laughs> that's that's why I was giving that shout out to Overstar in Cologne. <laughs> in 06 to 08, those do uh, Cologne said, Hey, I want you guys to set up this thing. I want to call it the FTX, that Bob Plight concept. And what was really cool about that kind of going back to what chief Cox was talking about was, we were given carte blanche, like, hey, this is invalidation. There's no go, no go criteria. Figure out a way to do this FTX at, at what you guys know as FOB Plight. And OB and I had free reign to do whatever we want. And we told all you guys, you're not going to fail. You're not, you know, you, we just want you to perform. And it was amazing as an instructor. My degree is in workforce education. So I did the SIU degree. Uh, and I have, a, you know, a couple of teaching degrees. And so, it was really cool to watch the, the, the learning curve of the students, their bodies relax, their minds relax, and their mindset change to, all right, I'm in the fight. I'm going to graduate. I just need to learn. And their performance skyrocketed. And what really sucks, and you guys probably live that, is when we finally said, okay, now it's a lesson plan and it's a PC and it's a go, no, go, it, got, it didn't become fun anymore for us because it it put a different kind of mental pressure on the, on the student where they were worried about pass fail instead of just learning. Uh, and so that's why I wanted to give that shout out that I, I really believe that that 06 to 08 timeframe was the best time of my career as an instructor, uh, just because we, we, we were allowed to do what we needed. Uh, and the, and the guys I think loved it. So. Well, I want to uh, explore, well, and I yeah, want to but, explore that a little bit, especially since you kind of you opened that door to the the Chief Cox podcast, and we talked about that attribute, you know, base model, and and you know who's the right guy and who's the wrong guy. You know, I'm I'm sure you've got a story about finding oh, yeah. the right guy or the wrong guy. There, there's actually several, but uh, most all of them are still in, and and some of them are chiefs now, so I won't go there. But there is one. Um, there's one guy that when I was at JSOMC, his name's Bill. Uh, most people know him in the community. But when I was at JSOMC, he, he kept failing the, the paramedic exam. He crushed the hands-on. He was doing really well with the hands-on. But every time that paramedic test got in front of him or a block exam, he'd bomb it. And then he would bomb the retest and he'd get set back. And the Army was very strict about two shots and you're done. 
Um, I did learn as a young instructor, I, I was mentored by my Navy counterparts there. There was a couple of SEALs there that took me under their wing. One in particular had been at BUDS, and another one was a former Tier 1 operator. And uh, they, I was a young staff sergeant, and they wanted to mentor me on looking at the total person and not just the black and white. Like, uh, not to bag on the Army, but they're very black and white. And the Navy guys were looking at them as, hey, they've been through BUDS already. Let's look at the total person concept here. And so this individual had something, whatever that something is, all of you guys that have been instructors know what I'm talking about. There's always that one guy that stands out. You're like, he's a big, dumb animal, but I fucking love him. Uh, and, <laughs> I want him on my team. I, yeah. I want that guy on my team. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want that guy on my team. There's something about this guy. So this dude ended up doing the paramedic four times. Uh, I, he, he failed the paramedic exam twice. They were going to boot him. I said, no, we got to keep him. I got into some pretty heated arguments with the Army and our Air Force leadership at the time down at Lackland. And uh, I said, we're keeping this guy, whether you like it or not. And so he took the paramedic test again and bombed it, made me look bad. And I, and I went back to the fight. I said, no, I'm telling you there's something about this guy. So he actually PCS to Albuquerque with me and went through that the whole course, zero to hero, all over again um, and, and finally passed. And uh, the folks that know what I'm talk- who I'm talking about out there, he turned out to be one of the, the best damn PJs our community's ever seen. And it was really funny to have guys lecture me and, and my peer group and my leadership at the time on that guy is going to be a mistake. You're going to regret it. He's going to get somebody killed someday. He's a terrible medic. And it just and then he turned out to be a real 12 outstanding airman of the year. Uh, uh, actually turned out to be a superhero, it, a legend. Yeah. 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 But I, I, I think that lends itself to what we've kind of, alluded to in other podcasts when we talk about that that thing you know it's that it's that tenacity that grit that you may not be the best at something you may not be the smartest dude but if you are giving it your all and you are putting out a hundred percent every single day with everything you do you're the guy that we want or the girl that we want on the team yeah, I used to tell the guys all the time, uh, uh, Aaron and Brian, if I remember, I used to tell them all like, no motivation or fa- false motivation is better than no motivation. 100%. I, like, I've <laughs> stolen that to this, it, to this day. To this day, I've stolen that. <laughs> I yeah, use that all the time. Yeah, Especially when you use the false motivation to really piss off the instructors. <laughs> Dude, I used to eat that shit up. I loved it. When, when, when I would have them in the – back when we could put them in the mud pit, uh, but when I'd have them in the mud pit there and, and – there was a couple of slam sessions. There was one, the guys used to call it the night of a thousand crocodile tears. We had a bunch of quitters, uh, in the apprentice course. I think you guys are talking about chief bean. I, I, I believe that might've been the same, the same slam, but uh, I want to talk about this. I get triggered by a lot of these things because I was in that mud pit three times during my apprentice course. No cops, no crows, no lefties. Worst. Oh, team that was of one all. of my favorite classes, man. Worst I still team. have that patch. That patch is on my, is in my office. I, 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 I oh, it was a great class. Oh, we are the worst. We are the no, worst. You guys are awesome. And you know what I loved about that class is your attitude. You guys are a bunch of fucking smart asses that, that were just happy to get smoked. Even though you weren't happy to get smoked, you pretended like you were happy to get smoked and it would diffuse the instructor like you know i don't know if you guys have read marcus luttrell's book who by the way is a former student of mine uh jay somsey in his book he talks about that like that just that false motivation out there fuck you you can't smoke me it diffuses the instructor we're like ah fuck yeah he's right we can't smoke him and you just get mad and go oh. <laughs> he's, hey wait a second i may, I may try i'm gonna try <laughs> these guys got a point yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give it my level best but i think they may have been too stupid for too long and got too strong yeah. for me to correct with push-ups yeah, even Admiral McRaven, I think, talks about it in his book about singing. If you guys have ever read that speech where you just sing when you're covered up to your head in mud or whatever, start singing. So, but yeah, it works. I, yeah, yeah, it sure does. So for your listeners, if they're looking at going in or if they're in right now and they know they're about to get smoked for something stupid tonight, it's it's some beatings are just worth it, you know, and uh, and, and you'll be all right. So. Well, so for those people that are looking to come in, you've seen, you know, a whole career, you know, 15 years of an instructor. That's a long time to watch, yeah, man. you know, the, the evolution of a cone. What are those traits that make, you know, no matter the time frame, no matter what, what are the traits that you've seen that make those people successful? This sounds so cliche, but it really is 80% mental. It, it, you see it on a kid day one. I, I know you guys, some of you guys were at the end doc or at the selections, like, you know, day one, you can see the, the, there's the fakers, the ones that pretend, you know, the, 
the wannabe badasses that are, that are they think they're there to be cool and be sexy, get the hair gel, whatever. Uh, and then there's like that one kid that that just stands out that you he's humble uh, or she uh, they're humble, they're quiet, professional kind of mentality. And they just they're just it's that whole mental status. I'll tell you, though, my favorite cones. Can we do you still call them cone heads? <laughs> you can't. Yeah. My, oh, yeah. favorite, my favorite term that has never caught on and this really pisses me off mm-hmm. is pre jays like why can't you pre jays like it, it makes total sense i like it oh yeah my my favorite student we'll say that my favorite student the ones i always gravitated to and i and i and i, I made them like that's my guy i want to help is it was because it was me the poor kid from a broken home who was too dude i had the lowest score in the on the asphalt I, I just got barely into the air force my dad was a Navy dude, and I'm like, I'm not going to the Navy because I don't want to go in the Navy. And I, I went and took the ASVAB, and I got the very minimum score to get into the Air Force. I didn't know that PJs did paramedic. When I got to the paramedic program, I'm like, what the hell? I, I, dude, I didn't even do pre-algebra in high school. And now they're wanting me to do drug dose calculations? Like This was before you guys had all this you know, cheat sheet and G2 on phones and stuff. So I just read the book cover to cover every day, every day. Covered, I read the whole paramedic book. Three times cover to cover before I took the exam, and I got a 98 on it, on the paramedic exam. So uh, my, so it was always like that poor kid who was dumb, who was broken home, that w- was didn't even understand why he was there. He just had something to prove or, or the ones that were driven by that, that others may live motto. And I would just latch on to those dudes and just lift them up. Most of those dudes, though, when they come back and find me, you know, after years later, they don't tell the story the way I tell it. They're like, dude, you were such an asshole to me. You rode my, and, like, and, it, and it never clicks with them. Like, oh, wait, he was looking out for me. And so, so some of those cones are students that are getting ragged on and think they're getting beat on. Uh, believe it or not, that attention is, is for a reason. And be happy that you're getting it. Uh, because there's somebody next to you that's not getting attention because they're the kiss ass. They're the brown noser. They're the guy that's just, they're in it for the wrong reasons. And we see through that and we don't care about those dudes. We care about the one that has the heart. So does that answer it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I any think, other brain um, busters? That covers it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was, uh, you know, from my perspective also, I think when I took that instructor role, um, a lot of people saw me as like cold and didn't care about them and that kind of stuff. And the truth is those people that really like hold back their emotions from, you know, Oh, I feel sorry for you. Like, yeah, we know it's hard and all that kind of stuff, but we want to see the end result being that you're going to be able to, you know, facilitate what we need for the teams and be that guy that's going to replace us one day. So if you withhold your emotions and just put them through that smoke sessions, some of the other instructors would be like, dude, you've been leaving them on like their feet jacked up for a really long time. No one can hold their feet up. And like, I don't care. They're going to do it until they finish and they do it as a team. And they, you know, end up I with skin yeah. yeah. My favorite, you dude, guys can my do favorite this. trick, my favorite trick. I loved it. I have so many stories of guys that are still in that I can't talk about where I would do what you did. I'd put them in the front leaning rest or I'd I'd have them like, you know, go out there and lay in the snow. And and then I would leave them there. And I was just like a right 10 feet away from them around the bush or on the other side of the wall. And I would just sit there and listen to them all bitch and complain and moan and get (laughs) mad and talk shit about each other and tell the one kid to shut up. And you would learn who the team really is and how close knit dynamic of a team they were and the strong teams, I mean, they got out of it in a hurry. But the weak teams, you just it's its blood in the water. Um, Go down that hole. Well, there's a thing called cone science that I think we need to talk about where the team will actually get stronger the more that you smoke them. And then they'll actually end up accomplishing the task, which doesn't make sense. Like the first task that you give them, they're, they, they're, they're unable to accomplish the task. And then they get smoked six times. And scientifically, I don't think it should work. But cone science says it definitely should not work. They it's, get stronger and they accomplish that task as a team. It's summarized in the enemy of my enemy oh, is my friend. And you become the hated enemy that because they're not getting along together as a team. Their dynamic sucks. Their leadership sucks. Whatever it is, it's usually a leadership problem within the team. And when they all collectively learn to hate you, they come together as, as a team to go against you and it works and, and they don't realize it. That, uh, that, that cone science, that thing is impenetrable because I'll tell you what, it's just like free fall school. You put on that yellow or orange suit of invincibility, you can do anything you want at free fall school. <laughs> Some of those landings that I took at like free fall and static line should have killed me. They would have killed me if I was an actual PJ, but because I was a student, completely protected. I've always <laughs> said cones are the most powerful force in the universe. 
They're, 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 they're real malleable. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're malleable. Nearly, they're nearly indestructible. They can accomplish anything. They don't ask too many questions. Like just can, can I tell you a back funny, to toddler state. Can I tell you a funny story without going too far down a rabbit hole about cone power? These dudes, we were in San. Yeah, we were, we were down in um, uh, here in, in Florida, and we it was during a water ops trip. And we had one of our big giant Boston whalers with the huge engines on the back. Uh, it, the trailer broke <laughs> off the truck, like the whole truck hitch just came crashing off. It was all rusted out. And a bunch of the instructors were arguing over, we got to get a forklift. Nobody, wa- nobody wanted to call the chief. It was a big deal. And I forget what class it was, what year it was, but there was this one lieutenant who was in charge of the team. And uh, he had had about, he was getting kind of fed up because they were getting beat on. And I walked out there and I said, sir, how many guys you got on their team? And it was like 22, 23. And I said, I guarantee if you get all your guys on this team, you can pick that boat up and put it back on that trailer. He didn't believe me. And I went in and the instructors, they were trying to get a forklift and fighting. And and what are we going to do? And I said, hey, why don't we just have the guys pick it up and put it on the trailer? Like, they can't do that. I'm like, bullshit. I've seen SF selection. Those dudes push tanks. Right. And so, so I go out there and I go, sir, here's what's going on. I gave them all the intel. I'm like, the instructors are in there fighting over this. This is a victory. If you can get this on that trailer, they're going to think you're a demigod and you guys are done for the day. Sure as shit, man. These guys picked up this boat, put it on the trailer. And I told the lieutenant go in there and tell said now chief what he just did. And they had their mouths drop, like mic drop. So the best they're, they're system is no system. <laughs> yeah. Never <laughs> underestimate cone power. Uh, Especially if you make yeah. it into a competition or a speed yeah. e- speed event against the instructors, oh wow, they'll win every time. <laughs> yeah, you're you're going to win in the end because you can smoke them, but they're going to walk <laughs> away going, "We got you." Yeah, the, the only thing more powerful than cones is the drop word. You know, that's yeah. that is it. And even that's then, the, even then, man, just smile. Who ya, Sergeant? Be happy that you're getting smoked. You know, yeah. and there, there's different tones of who ya, but um, <laughs> that there could be a book on that. <laughs> right. So, so you were an instructor for a long time and I, we could talk about cone yeah. stories and all this other stuff forever. And I, I would love to, but, um, once you got out, what did you know about the the space mission and how did you get involved with that? Like walk us down that road. Yeah. So, you know? so when I first came in, uh, the space shuttle mission was, a, was a thing. Um, and we were doing lots of towel sites and, and uh, as, as a lot of us are called the nineties PJs, like we just did shuttle stuff and r- civilian crap. Um, and, and Southern watch, I did do a couple of deployments there that sucked, but, um, we go overseas to some really horrible TDYs to Italy and Spain and, you know, really horrible per diem and not a good trip sarcasm. Uh, yeah. and we would support the space shuttle. So they were building the space station up in the nineties, uh, or late nineties. And the shuttle on at one point was going up four times a year. And so at the time, Moody was the primary for all the overseas, uh, they called them TAL sites, transatlantic abort landing sites. Patrick supported the local launch site primarily, and New York actually supported up the East Coast. Well, 9-11 kind of threw that for a loop and changed the dynamic. But I knew, I knew that PJs did the space mission coming into it uh, just because of the shuttle mission, and it was part of the recruiting video that I saw. When I... How I got to where I'm at was when I was kind of reaching the end of my instructor career. I was really looking for a way out. I had already switched to civil service and I was looking for a a better place to be. I have a wife with special needs and I I wanted to get back close to my family here in Florida. And I was actually down here at TDY uh, doing an air ops trip. And I reached out to Chief Shelton, who's a retired PJ chief that is in a position I'm in. And uh, I said, hey, man, when are you going to get me a job down here? Just jokingly. And he said, funny, you should ask. And he was looking for a replacement. How he or why he re- uh, hired me was actually because of all my time at the schoolhouse. He needed somebody who knew the career field because he knew the, the mission was rapidly changing. And he knew that I knew all the senior guys in the community because I either trained them or I went through school with them. And so that's kind of how I, I literally just stepped into it, just making a smart ass joke to an old chief of mine. And he's like, you want the job? And so that's how I got into it. And I've been here since uh, 2013 is when I, when I signed in and dude, I hit the ground running. Um, I don't know how much you want to get into it, but I can tell you who we are, the office and what we do. Well, like, is, is there like a selection process or is it a direct hire type thing or yeah. are you like very selective about who Not goes really. there? No, it's uh, so my organization, I can tell you this, it's detachment three, 45th operations group right now. Uh, that's subject to change. 
Uh, but our OpCon is when it comes to uh, U.S. astronauts. Uh, by the way, Pararescue has been doing this since 1958. Uh, when NASA stood up uh, in, in 1957, I think was the year they stood up, or 58, and we stood up a year later in 59, NASA uh, has these capsules back in the early days of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo that go into space and come back and splash down in the ocean. Well, NASA is a federal uh, government organization, taxpayer-funded uh, organization. So they needed assets to go recover and rescue if things go bad or if things land where they're supposed to, like in the Apollo days when you see uh, the big Navy ships out at sea recovering the capsule. That's all DOD, right? And so it, it was a logical uh, uh, marriage, if you will, between NASA and the DOD to work together as a tax, both taxpayer-funded entities to support the programs. Um, and then when shuttle stood up, all that open ocean with the ships and all that went away because it was a land lander and rescue was the primary. So uh, if you look at the history books back in the day, it was called AARS, Aerospace Rescue and Recovery Service is what it stood for. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a mission that never went away. It went on pause when the shuttle stood down. Now we're back to capsules again, and a lot of people ask why capsules. Well, because it's safer, uh, and we can have. We actually had an astronaut, Nick Hague, uh, who flew that beret that we you guys want to talk about, um, who ejected on 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 ascent. They had a, a rocket malfunction; the rocket blew up, and they ejected off of it and landed safely. If that would have been the space shuttle, he'd have been you know toast. Dude, so, his adrenaline is still jacked up. Yeah. So, so the, the, can you imagine the, just yeah. not not even an ejection seat ride, but like I'm getting off a rocket. Yeah, with the whole capsule ejects. It's is a. It's really cool. There's, there's really there's really cool videos out there of of a bunch of tests that I was involved in uh, very recently. The one rocket that blew up over the ocean. Uh, I was right there in a freaking wing boat with a couple of dudes and drove right up to that thing and did some TTP development on it when it splashed down. Really cool. But we so so we have a couple of programs that the DoD is involved in that a lot of listeners don't know. One's the Soyuz, the Russian program. So when the Russians come home, we just had Chris Cassidy, uh, a Navy captain, come home from space just very recently. They land in Kazakhstan uh, out there in the flats. Uh, some of you guys know where that is. And when there's a NASA asset, whether it's a DOD astronaut or a government civilian astronaut, or even if it's a, a foreign partner, they call them NASA sponsored, like a, a Canadian or whatever, we actually task an AEC CAT team um, and, and pa uh, uh, posture out of uh, Germany for that. And then we have the Orion program, which is not as uh, famous in the news. Back in 2014, I was out in the ocean with the Navy on a ship to recover that capsule uh, unmanned. And that's the deep space. We're going to go to moon. We're going to go to Mars. We're going to go asteroids, all that stuff. Um, that's a few years down the road. And then we have the commercial crew program, which is like Uber and Lyft. NASA said, hey, uh, let's contract the ride to the space station because we know how to do that now. And we want to focus our money and attention on deep space and let's fix price contract out uh, Uber and Lyft, Boeing, SpaceX, uh, to give us a ride to the ISS. SpaceX is a little bit further along, uh, but there's two. And we've already launched there a few times. But who we are is the DOD. Um, now it's the commander of U.S. Spacecom is the um, supported commander uh, for all things terrestrial rescue uh, of, of these NASA assets and all things space, OpCon-wise. Uh, and then U.S. Space Force is our ADCON, uh, our kind of uh, uh, OT, uh, the, the train and equip, if you will. And then uh, our operations are under uh, SpaceCom. The office itself is the Department of Defense Human Spaceflight Support Office. Uh, that's been the name for a while. Uh, we have a, a, a detachment uh, designation that's going to change probably in the future. And it's a mixed bag of rescue pilots. Uh, we have a, a retired crow. We have a retired PJ tier one operator chief. Um, we have myself, we have another GS just like me, who's a reservist as well, a senior master sergeant PJ. Um, and then we have a master diver. It's a, a bunch of firemen. It's an office of, Hey, we've got a, a, a guy or gal for that. Uh, Dr. Sylvia, if you guys remember her from the schoolhouse, she's my boss. Um, and we do all the coordination and training of the forces that are tasked to support these rescues and recoveries. So, so you know, big question, uh, I think for a lot of the listeners out there is obviously Pararescue has been doing this for a really long time. Yeah. And, um, we have a kind of unique skill set that's, you know, for us to be able to do this kind of thing. Um, why is it Pararescue that's in charge of this thing? Cause you have the whole DOD, you mentioned the Navy already being involved and a bunch of other people that do, you know, extrication and rescue medic type. Mm -hmm. Um, why is uh Pararescue uniquely set a, to do this kind of mission? 
Awesome question. We get that all the time, actually, from other uh, organizations. So the scenario that's painted is, uh, and we just launched um, our, our four astronauts uh, just very recently that are on the space station now. And prior to that, we put two up and two down. Uh, and we tasked, it's, uh, it's been the big three that have been supporting the, the active duty RQSs, about 20 PJs or so, in addition to 60s uh, here at Patrick with 130s. When I say here at Patrick, it's not the 920th here at Patrick. It's whatever unit was tasked in their window. It's an actual tasking now, not like the old days. Um, and, and the reason why we went with Air Force Rescue and specifically, and I say we, the DOD down selected to that, was when an astronaut comes home from space or when they're launching up on the capsule, if they have a catastrophic type event, there are a lot of issues. And the big one is uh, has gas, hydrazines. These guys can inhale this stuff and it, it jacks them up. Um, and so what NASA put in their requirement, and when I say requirement, NASA has what's called a uh, RFA, a request for assistance, that went literally from NASA Administrator, Secretary of Defense. Hey, you, this is me. I need this capability. And then that worked its way down into a, a program document, a requirement document. And they specifically asked for paramedic level care. They want folks that can do ACLS. They want folks who can innovate. They want and do RSI. They want folks who can do blood administration. They know and we know that a lot of different agencies can, can jump in the middle of the ocean and get to these packages. But can they also provide that advanced medical care? Um, and that's where paramedic comes in. A lot of folks don't know way back in the day, back in my day, the reason why PJs were being pushed to keep their paramedic was because of the NASA mission. Uh, and so that we could, and it was the same requirement back then is they wanted paramedic level care and what comes with that. Uh, so who out there in the DOD can provide paramedic level care, can do halo, uh, and static line in any, in, in any condition, as you guys all know. Uh, and right now, they're the, the Air Force Rescue guys, specifically the Guardian Angel teams, are the, really the only dogs in that fight. And so um, that's that's currently why those forces are tasked. Not saying they're not the only game in town, but they're they're the most proficient and trained and skilled teams in town to do it. So okay. And then uh, you know, for the viewers out there, I know you know we know all the capabilities that we have and stuff, and how we kind of would employ these things. Mm -hmm. But what would it look like? You know, uh, best scenario a capsule comes into the ocean or whatever pjs are tasked to rescue what do they do to make that happen yeah so, so on day of launch we have a uh, couple of hh60s here at patrick with the 130 and they're loaded out with rams or uh i don't know what you guys call them now but a, a zodiac boat folded up in a box with parachutes uh the 60s have all all the advanced medical gear so the 60s have the blood and rsi drugs and the ventilators are all on there and then the jumpers have the ability to jump with a small, uh, just a march bag or a combat bag. Um, and they, they, if it's locally within a few hundred miles, uh, they have a requirement to get there and get them out and get them to a local hospital within six hours. And so they've got small boats, jet skis, um, all this specialized equipment to hook up to the capsule, to stabilize the capsule. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's universal stuff that we went with because the PJs are responsible for three different spaceships, or will be soon. Um, and, and so they have all the specialized tools that NASA gives them, specialized tools that we made for them, and then the standard stuff that they have at the unit level. And Charleston is the team that's up the East Coast. It's a C-17 with all the same stuff in the back of a C-17. And the reason why that is it's a global reach capability. That capsule can be in a matter of minutes right off the coast of Florida or all the way over an island. And so we needed that global reach capability of the C-17. And then on the other side of the world, because the capsule actually has the ability to abort and go around, or once it's on orbit, it goes around the Earth. The ISS goes by every 90 minutes. Uh, and so anywhere between 516 North, 516 South, anywhere in the globe, they can come down. And so we needed to place somebody in another part of the world to cover a 24-hour requirement to get to them. And so Hawaii became the choice uh, and, and, uh, as long Naturally. as Charleston. Well, <laughs> yeah. C-17 bases. Uh, uh, geographically, yeah. there's actually better spots, but we, we needed that C-17 aircraft, um, or that was the aircraft that met the capability. And it's nice to put them at bases that are C-17 bases. So when Chalk 1 breaks, we just go over to Chalk 2, and we don't have to have two to make one. They're just there. So. Uh, it's a terrible TDY for, well, actually the last two missions have been horrible for the PJs going to Hawaii because they were locked down due to COVID. <laughs> oh, I, uh, my boy was the team leader. My boy is a team leader that was quarantining for 14 days prior to. So we were, I was yeah. laughing. I was like, Oh, how cool is it now guy? Yeah. Those dudes, uh, a guy named Ivan and you all know who I'm talking about. It's like, <laughs> Hey man, if I'm going to do this next mission, 
uh, where do I want to go? I'm like, you want to go to Charleston <laughs> because of the COVID. So the guys that went to Hawaii couldn't even leave the, the, the hotel. Like they couldn't even go out the door. <laughs> so uh, That's the worst. Just sleeping with their surfboard. That's it. Just yeah, crying, man. <laughs> just crying themselves Get a asleep. In. <laughs> so but yeah, to answer your question, Sean, it's or uh, uh, Silva, it's uh, it's it's a bunch of the boats and skis and med gear and specialized tools uh, uh, that can leave the plane. Tech rescue stuff to get in and get the doors open and, and ropes if needed to pull them out. Sorry, man. No, no, that's perfect. So I, that actually segues in pretty well. Like now that you've been in this, like. We always say, you know, PJs, aspect war, all the career fields, we're, we're problem solvers, right? You're just yep. dealing with an extensive problem set. Your problem set now involves space if you don't believe that the earth is flat, which I can't believe you keep saying it goes around the earth. We know that there that's not a thing. <laughs> I, I just don't understand why you keep saying it anyway. Um, but I bet there are, problems. <laughs> there are some problems <laughs> that you encountered that you couldn't even forecast. Do you have some examples of some of those problems that, that you've been trying to think through? Yeah, so we actually, when I say we, my office, the Human Spaceflight Support Office, even though it's a team of has-been PJs and pilots and whatever, we have active duty as well, we don't actually, I'm the guy that gets the paper and gives it to the guy. You know, we don't, we get in there and we get our hands dirty and we, and, and we get wet, but really what we do is we hand the shit sandwich to you, the PJ teams. Uh, and we started with the test units, 88 test, and then eventually the uh, Guard and Reserve test unit, and then teams come in. So we give them the problem to solve. So when you say we solve the problem, it's actually you that solves the problem and we gave it to you to figure out. But some of the stuff that the guys have had to figure out is how to gain access safely. So think about this capsule, man. It's it's a little uh, – you guys are too young to know what a weeble wobble is. But these little toys that would weeble and wobble in the <laughs> ocean. You. Peaches so knows what a weeble wobble is. Peaches is <laughs> actually a weeble wobble. You can't – that's, that's, center that's, of gravity that's is fair. So, his center of gravity is so low, you can't actually knock him over. He's impossible. Yeah. Am I supposed so, to argue against that? I, <laughs> <laughs> Those things are really so, – so some of them are designed to land in the water, like Boeing – or I'm sorry, Orion and SpaceX. But, but Boeing is not designed to land in the water. And so when they land – if they land in a place that PJs are coming, it's probably not a good day, right? And so it's a very unstable capsule in the water. And so finding creative ways to stabilize that capsule in the open ocean. So we started in a pool out at Houston at the big clear neutral buoyancy lab. Lots of PJs have been there now. A really cool place to go dive if you ever want to work it out. I can give you the POCs. You guys can schedule a dive there with your team. Uh, well, not now because of COVID, but when it goes away. Um, but we did all this testing in the pool, and then we took it out into a basin in, here at Port Canaveral, and then we took it out in the open ocean in some real ways. We're like, yeah, that didn't work. Uh, and so what we learned from that is just because we thought it worked in the pool and just because we thought it worked in the basin doesn't mean it's going to work in the real ocean. It's really surprising to me how many teams don't do uh, regular training in the open ocean. You know, everybody comes to Florida and does banana river jumps. Everybody goes to Herbie and does whatever that uh, water DZ that's up there. You know, how many teams are actually jumping in the real waves in the real open ocean on a regular basis? Not many teams. Are, uh, California does it because they're doing missions, it seems like, every other day. Uh, but, but that was the big lesson learned was dealing with things that we thought worked in the pool and taking it in the limited and expensive time that we have in the open ocean and then trying to figure that out on a fly. And uh, we over-engineered stuff. And then, of course, it's always the young freaking E3, E4 PJ that says, uh, hey, this five cent widget will do a better job than the thirty thousand dollar piece of crap that we bought. You know, so <laughs> it's exactly everything that you're talking about. I just imagine it's exactly like that scene in Armageddon where they start <laughs> ripping a ripping apart the lunar lander thingy that they use. They're just like, what is this piece of crap? Ice cream scooper that costs you thirty thousand dollars. Well, that's that's just a, a really good example of how we use problem solving. Like how the you know even the people that are listening right now like. How does that actually translate to the students in the pipeline? Like what problems have you seen in the pipeline that you would give students that they're able to attack it and just figure out answers like you? Uh, so the first thing you said when you said problem solving, the first thing that popped in my head was those damn crows who overanalyze everything you throw at them. The, the crow <laughs> candidates. I'm sure the Stowe community has the same problem. You're like, all right, sir, I want you to take this soda bottle and move it from this desk to that desk. And he's got to build a 20-point 
PowerPoint, pre- he overanalyzed, just moved it. And then the, the two stripers like, all right, and he just moves it. Um, I, I think sometimes it's the, it's the keep it simple, stupid process that s- tends to work. And, and to give you a, a perfect example to tie it into the space program, we had this really uh, expensive uh, flotation system that we use to capture the capsule like a donut. So if you go and look at any pictures of any capsules in the ocean from the old days, you'll see this orange donut around and it stabilizes it. It works really good. When it's installed, those capsules are rock solid. But in really rough seas, that thing is really hard to install and it actually makes it counterproductive and more dangerous. The risk management goes up. And so that risk assessment where you have to stabilize the capsule to get them out safely, but you're putting the guys at serious risk just trying to stabilize the damn thing. I don't know who it was, but it was probably the lowest ranking guy on the team that said, hey, you know when I'm I'm in my boat and I'm fishing and it's rocking and rolling and I'm getting seasick, I just start driving and get it on plane and then it stabilizes. And that's a technique we have now because some just guy thinking through the simplistic approach we drag the capsule, and as it's being drugged, it actually stabilizes on plane in rough seas, and then you just do kind of like you're doing an underway, and you just pull them out that way, and it was super simple. So keep it simple, stupid is the best way to approach. Ladies yeah, and gentlemen, tell that kid to yeah. shut up and steal his idea. <laughs> shut up. <that'll laughs> like, you don't know what you're talking about. And like, leave the room one, and be like. I call this one the Manny Maneuver, boys. You're never going to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I figured it out just now. I think, a, well, I can't say his name because it's too rare of a name. Everybody will know. But I think there's a crow out there that might have taken credit. <laughs> oh, oh, oh called it. Ooh, if, he called watches it. This, if he watches this podcast, he knows who he is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Go check us out on YouTube. Drop, drop some, some names in the comment section. Let's get it out there. Yeah, my, last one, my last one for you on this space is, is easy. Like we, can't, we keep talking about, and I've said it a million times, right? Like the first PJ to deploy from like low orbit to get a space rescue is going to be intolerable at parties. That's all they're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah. D- do you think that's a reality? Do you think that there there's no kidding a reality where one day we could be st- like sitting alert, no kidding on some sort of low orbit vehicle? Uh, so, for an so event? That comes up a lot. And I have been involved in conversations uh, about that. That's what we call in domain rescue, right? My office specifically focuses on terrestrial rescue. So they're coming home and they land on Earth and it's a terrestrial rescue. That, that 50-year plan, uh, and I know this U.S. Spacecom commander uh, and some of the folks within the Space Force bring that up at the highest levels, that in-domain rescue, even though our office sometimes gets into a conversation or two about that, it's really not our wheelhouse. The, our, our swim lane is they came home, they hit Earth, where are they at? Go get them. It's really an IP. It's a classic PR mission. Uh, I, I have to give a shout out to the SEER community. They actually have played a huge role in this, in this, uh, in this mission, especially at the JPRA and the, the, the PRCC levels. Uh, but it's, it's just a good old classic pickup game uh, out there in the ocean. It just happens to be really unique who you're going to. And then the medical status of those individuals, their bodies aren't the same if they've been up there for a long time. I, I got to be honest. I, this is fascinating, right? And it's, I mean, it's going to be the future as SpaceX and Boeing and, and whatever Amazon's one continues to, to go up in the space. Do you, since you're, you're so deeply ingrained in this, do you see any other career fields like maybe a combat controller uh, kind of getting involved uh, in this too? Uh, uh, maybe it's am I right, guys? All right. right. <laughs> All right. So I know that you're a chief or a chief select. Let me tell you about a conversation I had in 2013 when we were doing an operational planning team on who gets this mission. When it hit, it was an OPT on the high side with 06s and above. It hit the AFSOC desk and they said, we're not interested. So you guys shot your own selves in the foot. <laughs> Man, that, that, to be that, completely that, that, honest, to complete to be completely honest <laughs> with you, you'd be an idiot not to take a controller or a JTAC. The reason why I say that is, and I know there's PJs out there like, oh, it's a PJ mission. I know the history, right? <laughs> I, I lived it. But the 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 guys are going to be somewhere in the world. It's a water rescue. We're only there for the ter- the water rescue. The, if it goes on land, it's a whole different a whole different wheelhouse of issues. But if it if it's in 
There's a part in the Pacific Ocean where the Coast Guard is saying that it'll take up to 96 hours for an asset to get to you, uh, a ship of some sort, because it's just no man's land out there. And by the way, that's part of where these guys track. Um, and so I'm going to bag on my crow buddies. A crow is floating in the middle of the ocean with a, a, a PRC 117 and a sat phone. You know, he's going to screw it up. Right. So I, I, I've, I've said from the very beginning, you'd be a dumbass not to take a, a, a seasoned radio operator on this mission. Um, the medical requirement is pretty clear, you know, but we only need four medics or one medic per astronaut is what the requirement is. So uh, I think, yes, when we when we first started this game, when I first got this job, we said, hey, this should not just be a good old fashioned AARS. This should be a total force thing. And uh, you guys are too busy. Well, well, I mean, that's I, I take it back to the, you know, yeah. the traditional CSAR construct that we used to do the combat yeah. search and rescue for the people that don't know what CSAR is. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, I mean, we used to have two PJs and a controller. And a controller, yeah. And, that, and, a, I mean, and a ranger team sometimes. And yeah. and we would wreck shop. Mm -hmm. We would do amazing stuff. Um, yeah. And we went away with that from for a bunch of different reasons. But, um, yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm, man, that's the future. And, and you would yeah. think that we would be a when, little bit more interested in when it. When I got read into by the half dudes about this new spec warfare concept with the new AFSC, and when we got told you guys might all re-back a line under AFSOC, I know that got killed at the very last minute, uh, I was giddy. I'm like, holy, because there's a lot of commanders out there. The rescue squadron commanders are like, wait a minute, you need how many of my guys for how many days, and this doesn't count as a deployment? Like they're not real happy, um, and it's 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 a tasking, not an asking. You know, it's coming from the co. It's actually coming from the joint staff, um, and so uh, it, it's hard on the commanders and the DOs and the schedulers. The guys love the mission when they get to do it, but the dude running the schedule is not happy. Uh, so if we could blow this up to the bigger the bigger uh, community, um, it would help. But yeah, I, I was I was excited when I thought it was all going to realign. I'm like, that's perfect because then that squadron level commander can go, all right, what's my tasking? And he can do his mission analysis and go, here's who you're getting. I don't tell you who to bring. I tell you, here's the requirement. You tell me who you're bringing. And that's well, how that, it That's a really good point, work. though. We're going yeah. to Mars. We're going to yeah. M-A. <laughs> M-A-R-S, baby. We're going to Mars. <laughs> Elon's going to beat you there. Gotta go get Matt Damon again. Save him. That's a good movie. <laughs> that is a good movie. I do like that one. But so... As as so many uh, you know DoD and especially SOCOM entities uh, try and support themselves organically, meaning using their own people, not to insult your intelligence, but you know yeah. for for listeners that aren't familiar with that term, um, do you foresee the Space Force kind of absorbing instead of you know asking doing a request for PJs? Do you foresee mm -hmm. them actually? generating their own force or absorbing pjs into the space force well that so that question was point blank asked to the four star that currently runs space force by uh, again i won't say his name but he's a retired pj chief very recently retired tier one guy uh, uh up there and he works with us now as a contractor and we had a uh, an open forum with the four star and he said hey sir i got a question for you and he asked that exact question and uh, General Raymond didn't have an answer because they hadn't thought about that yet. Um, I know it's being discussed. Um, I just I don't think they're ready to have those discussions because when when you talk about what we're doing for the space force and space com uh, and what their visions are and and uh, you know a lot of what they're doing is satellites, ISR asset stuff. So we're just like you know the smallest little piece on their radar right now. Uh, yeah, but so it's still human lives. It sure is. So. Whether they ever get their own Space Force PJs or or they just can because you know the Space Force is like the Marine Corps to the to the uh, Navy, so it's a mm -hmm. it's a, a department of. So we don't know yet. And then another thing that comes up too is why does it have to be GA or Air Force Rescue? Can't it be you know Marine? Can it be the Navy guys? Can it be the Army? Can it be you know whoever else that's out there that can bring that capability? My office is not. You know, we're not here to task PJs. We're here to meet a requirement that NASA gave us that we pushed over uh, to the U.S. Uh, Space Command and said, hey, here's NASA's requirement. And the joint staff right now says, give it to GA. And then GA's got it. But 
Uh, is that sustainable? I don't know. I don't know what the ops tempo looks like right now. It sounds like it's not very good. Uh, when the ops tempo goes down, maybe it won't be a problem, you know? All right. And so I want to switch gears here a little bit and talk about some beret stuff real quick before we get into kind of opening the floor to you. Everybody so, knows Maroon's better. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Next question. Because, because, Hachi, Hachi, Hachi. Next slide. Because that thing's been out into space. So everyone, you know, listening to this, you've probably seen on Instagram that picture of the beret floating out in space for yeah. retirement. So, you know, you, you were able to get that. You're the one that facilitated that, correct? Yeah. Yeah, man. So you were able to do that and kind of just with the the area that you're working in and do that for um, that retirement is super awesome. Memorable pick. We'll put it up in the YouTube, like just as a flash, if you want to go check it out and then we'll put it in the stories and stuff. So you guys can check it out and super awesome retirement, like one of a kind gift. And now everyone's going to be asking for that as they retire. Like how how are you going to top that? How are you going to top that? It's like a a rainbow of berets out in space. (laughs) I I went through the pipeline with Ron Thompson, chief Thompson. He just retired (laughs) and he sent me an invite to his retirement. Like, bro, I haven't talked to you in 10 years. I love you if you're listening. I love you, brother. Sorry, I couldn't make it. <laughs> wait a second. Wait, wait a second. It's yeah, funny how many people have invited me to their retirements now. <laughs> <laughs> it might be like a four-hour um, conversation with him, though. For never mind. <laughs> and then, so the second thing you wanted to talk about was zebra ray that you were bringing up before we were coming on here, and I just want to give you the floor to just kind of talk about that. Real yeah. Quick. So, so. Um, What's really cool about this job is I work at the whole office, but really the, the, the handful of GA backgrounds that we have, uh, and then my, my immediate supervisor, Dr. Sylvia and I, we have a very direct link to the astronauts. Um, I'm, I'm actually personal friends with quite a few of them. Uh, not just them, but we have a direct link to their physicians. Um, and now I don't know if you guys all know this, I I won't say his name. I'll let him share it. But, uh, there is a, a PJ named Cody who is working in Houston at NASA. Uh, they have, uh, an emergency, um, response type team there. And I helped, I helped, uh, advocate for the guys. So he's there now. So I have a direct link to that office and the people that he works with, uh, and then a direct link to their doctors and to the astronauts themselves. And over the years, the PJs, when we do this just-in-time type training, when the guys get tasked, we spin them up, and then we ship them out, right? And a lot of times when we do that training, uh, prior to COVID hitting us, the astronauts are right there with you. They're, they're the ones that you're actually pulling out of the capsule. They're the ones that you're working with one-on-one. And sometimes it's no kidding the astronauts like uh, Mike Hopkins, who just went up as the commander. I've worked with that dude a bunch of times. Uh, Victor Glover, the other guy. Uh, I've been out to sea with him a few times as well. And the PJ team's a task as well. So you develop a re- relationship. So uh, Z-Man, everybody that knows Z-Man, Chief Z, 33-year PJ. When I moved back here, Z was my mentor as a young PJ. I did two deployments with him, you know, back when the war was easy, right? And uh, as a young pup PJ, he's who I looked up to. Like, uh, there were a lot of guys in my generation that weren't very good mentors. And, uh, and he was truly one of them. Uh, and he's the reason why I selected for the 24th. Um, I got hurt, didn't make it, but, but it, he pushed me to go do that. Um, and when I heard that he had extended and that would put him at 33 years, I, it was two years in the making, by the way, to get that. So we thought he was going to retire and I heard they, the word got out. Hey, Z just extended. He's, he's going to, he's going to do another two more years. That'll put him at 33 years. So I reached out to a friend of mine over at NASA and uh, I said, whose ass do I got a kiss to get a beret flown in space? Um, and so we found a guy, uh, his name is Colonel Nick Haig. Uh, he's an air force, uh, full bird Colonel. Uh, academy grad. And he said, I'm interested in doing that for some, for a PJ. And uh, he said, give me all your information. And so I went to the commander of the 308 at the time. And I said, Hey man, this is like highest level classified. I got an idea and I need you to give me this information and nobody else can know about it except for me and you. And he's like, what do you, and I told him, and he's like, bullshit, I'm not going to do this. So, I, so what he did is he, he pulled all of Z's uh, EPRs and wrote up this really nice write-up and sent it. And uh, our connection out there took it to uh, Nick Haig and said, hey, man, here's this guy. And uh, Nick's like, dude, you had me at 33-year PJ. That's how cool that guy is. What makes that story interesting is 
So we fly stuff. We have stuff that's up there right now, like patches and coins and things little. And we give them to like, you know, group and wing level. To, you can't give every single person something because you'll run out. Uh, but you can, you know, hang something on the wall at a, at a squadron level. And the squadrons that have currently supported the mission are all getting stuff. Um, so normally that's a, a very long process and it usually goes up on a cargo ship and it flies around in space and comes back and you don't get a picture taken. What, what Nick Haig did is uh, Colonel Haig put it in his carry on. Um, and so they're very, very limited on what they can bring up on volume and, and weight, uh, because it's, 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 it's literally rocket science. And, uh, Colonel Haig saw Z's bio and, and, and he's like, I'm taking that in my personal carry on. Uh, so it went up. Um, and then he goes up cause usually the cargo that their, their stuff goes up on a different launch and then his launch happened and he aborted. Um, so there's a link to this uh, video of, of Colonel Haig talking to Z-Man. It's, I believe it's on the 920th public affairs website. Uh, and it's the speech that he gave, uh, about his experience. And on his launch, it aborted. That was that one where the rocket collapsed in and it popped off. Uh, 20 minutes later or so, he was picked up by the Russian PJs, and it gave him a whole new respect, not only for the bio he read, but then now he just experienced being rescued by the <laughs> Russian rescue forces. Uh, and, and so he was, he was kind enough to take it out of the package and let it float there in space and, and took a picture for us. Um, there's also a patch that was flown. It's a 308 patch that I, I gave at the same ceremony, dedicated it to the 5-1 crew and all the folks at the 308 because that had happened in the time frame as well uh, while I was up there. But that was two years in the making to get it up there, and it flew for almost a year. You know, wow. Nobody knew. Z-Man had no idea. That was, that was probably the hardest kept secret ever. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> That is yeah, a ton of work to get that to – to be go to fruition, but I'm sure that guy, he, he has that mounted up somewhere over his fireplace or somewhere. Yeah. You know, Made in him place cry. Of honor. It's super awesome. Man. Uh, and if awesome you, if you ever come too. to the 308, the, the 308 patch, uh, I don't know where they're hanging it cause they're getting a new building, but there's a patch and it's flown also same photo. Uh, we dedicated that to, to the, to the unit, uh, especially post five one. All right. And I want to just open the floor for you, um, you know, completely because, you know, we don't have anybody that ever comes on that knows this much about the space mission and kind of how PJs are going to be um, operating in that space. Uh, literally, if you do that, I guess. But, um, you know, what would you want people to know? Guys that are coming in, um, they're looking to do PJs. What do you need them to know about this space mission and kind of where it's going? So. Uh, it, it, if I was speaking to cones, you know, it, or, you know, what, recruits and they're on the fence, do I go PJ or whatever? Uh, if you dig medicine, th that's what you have to be good at to support this NASA mission. It, it, it boils down to, we all know there are units out there that can jump, can dive and, and, and get into the ocean anywhere in the globe. Right. But can they bring that advanced medical capability and can they sustain life for 72 hours? And that's what we have. Um, the medical assemblage that we built, uh, which is out there now that the squadron commanders now know I brief it at the Moab every year. Um, we have a no kidding 72 hour medical package. I, I brief it to the two, four Sal SG, uh, as well. So the PJs are floating in the open ocean, worst case scenario with four astronauts who've been in space for a long time and they're deconditioned, their bodies are limp. They're really, really sick because they have fluid loss from being in space. They've got motion sickness on top of that from being in space in addition to motion sickness from floating in a raft. Um, and they're sick and you've got to be on your medical game. And uh, so that, you know, I loved it when I would hear the paramedic students bitch about you know, I signed up to do combat medicine and TCCC and PJs or they, those idiots, you know, that talked that way. I'm like, go be a ranger medic, man, or go, go do something else. Like this isn't for you. Medicine is what makes us unique. Uh, in addition to the technical rescue piece of it, you know, your ropes and rescue and confined space stuff. Uh, but w w if you don't have those two skill sets, then you're just another dude who can jump in the ocean. Uh, so that, that's my advice is for all those guys that are struggling about medical or think medical's not it, then this isn't the career for, field for you and you need to be on your game and you don't have to be smart coming in. I mean, I, I was an idiot right out of high school. I didn't even, I barely got in just read the damn book and you'll be all right. 
Well, it's the silver lining. We, the we, silver we, line. we, we coined that term last week. The silver lining is there's a, there's a line of diminishing returns. You can't be too stupid. You need to be smart. Right. But there's, yeah. looks like with those crows, that big old brain starts weighing them down. It starts yeah. in the way it, it gets, it gets in the way at ASVAB score. Can't be too high. <laughs> yeah, man. There's a lot of PJs. I mean, Chris, uh, well, he's out now, but he's a cardiothoracic surgeon. You know, there's a lot of people, the Mike there in Albuquerque, he's an ER doc, uh, uh, Silva, you're a PA now. I mean, I, I, I've lost count how many PJs became PAs. Mm-hmm. No, and I know uh, the cardiothoracic surgeon, I'll just stick to his first name. That dude struggled in paramedic. <laughs> now he's a cardiothoracic surgeon. <laughs> Maybe not for much longer. I don't know. <laughs> well, Brent. Uh, you are an absolute wealth of knowledge, and yeah. I, I'd say probably give it about two months, and then you'll probably see a resume from me just coming into the Space Force. You know, whatever. Just saying. I mean, I'm just prepping it now, warm it up, greasing the skids. Take a look at it, ignore it, whatever you want to do. But well, you, you um, bring up a good point there, Chief. Uh, this mission that we do is not the only space game in town. If you have an engineering background, it, you guys that have comms backgrounds, um, anybody with an electrical engineering background, communications background, uh, anybody that does r- rescue recovery background, these companies, remember Boeing, SpaceX, Blue Origin, which is the Bezos company, Sierra Nevada, which is a company people aren't tracking, but there's about five, six, seven companies out there that are getting into the commercial space travel. They all have a need that they don't realize they need yet. SpaceX does, and they're already starting to hire. There's a, there's a contracted helicopter company. It's a blue and white helicopter that supports some of the schools that has uh, former PJs that is the same helicopter and the same air crews that go and land on the SpaceX ship and bring those guys home. So, so don't think that you can just come to me because we don't pay that good. We're federal. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Well, I'm, the- I'm sure Virgin uh, Galactic needs some people too. So maybe I'll reach yeah, out man. to them. <laughs> There's a niche. There absolutely is a niche. It's just, it's a, it's a brand new, it's in its infancy. And, and the, uh, all these really smart engineers that don't have a uh, uh, real world experience are starting to learn that they need to hire guys like you or, or folks that might be out there and come into their first term and like, what do I want to do? I want to get out, whatever. Uh, and I've run into quite a few PJs that we've trained that are looking for an exit. Um, one in particular just put in an astronaut package and his resume, man, is solid, solid resume. It's, it's, it's a, a, a high hill to climb, but Johnny Kim made it and he was a SEAL corpsman turned astronaut, you know, so. I love it. I love all the excitement behind space now. So again, your wealth of knowledge. I, I, I pleasure, you know, meeting yeah, you virtually. Thanks for coming on. And for everybody else that's watching or listening, uh, if you don't mind, if it's not too much to ask, maybe hop on Apple Podcasts, leave us a review, tell us what you think, engage with us on Instagram or Facebook or hit info at onesready.com or you can hit any one of us with just our first name at onesready.com and we'll hit you up. Thanks for joining us. See you guys later. 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 Peace out.